So let's let's discuss a little bit finite element for unsteady PDEs. There is a, there is not much new, but there is one thing that pops up that is very different from finite difference or finite volume for solving unsteady PDEs. That is, even if you have a simple time derivative term after applying finite element, the time derivative term is no longer going to be simple. There is what's called a mass matrix that is popping up uh, in the time derivative term. So, so let's say you have partial u, partial t. Uh, again, let me just use the very simple example of Poisson C uh, of heat equation, we still have the second order derivative operator. But later on, uh, we're going to see if you change this to some other differential equation, what happens to the time derivative term is going to be the same. Okay, again, we project the residual of the equation into a basis, uh, into a, a, a function space, right? So that means the left hand side minus right hand side times a v integrated in the spatial domain a and b has to be zero for any v this has to be zero for any time at at all time let's say this is the time domain we solve the differential. So we use finite element only in space, not in time. Uh, you can also apply finite element to space and time, but like we are not going to discuss it in this class. So if you apply this to space and time, then you have to choose a function space that is in the dimension of space time. So if you are solving, let's say this is a 1D heat equation, then you have to choose a function space that is basically space of two dimensional functions that is the, the v has to be a function of space and time but here we are we are using the more classical way of uh, of treating only the spatial dimension using finite element and integrating the time dimension still using uh, od integration method okay so if you choose this uh, then then if you do that you have to enforce this equation for all time so this enforcement is going to give me for any v within the x, okay, uh, and u has to be in the solution. Let's say uh, u of uh, uh, in the solution uh, in in the space x of b. Also, like we are enforcing potentially enforcing uh, essential boundary condition through the choice of x b. So find an element following. I want a pen. Find an element following the same logic we did before is we choose VH now within the XH, a subspace of X. And uh, uh, we stick to the same formulation. The same formulation except for uh, let's let's actually write it out. Uh, so, so let me just write it out this way minus partial square uh partial x square times vh dx equal to zero so vh is now a subspace and the uh is also a subspace of xb and what's next after we write down the same uh, equation in the restricted space Oh yes, uh, we forgot to do integration by parts. Uh, we should, actually, we should have done integration by parts uh, in the beginning before we restrict the space. So actually, let's 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 be more rigorous and uh, uh, do the integration by parts here. So the integration by parts should give us should give us. Uh, oh, first of all, let me. Let me do this. Let me split these two terms into into different integrals. So partial u partial t times v dx. Uh, then we should only do integration by parts to the second term, right? So minus 
partial u partial x times v at the boundary a and b plus integration a and b partial u partial partial x partial v partial x dx this has to be equal to zero all right and the same formula translate into the finite element formulation which is in the restricted space and the next after this how do we derive a system of algebraic equations to solve yeah we bring the solution oh uh, we bring the the solution approximation through the basis of the restricted space right and then quadrature and then quadrature yeah so so bring the restricted space means we are representing uh as uh0 which is the thing we use to satisfy the boundary condition plus a summation of i goes from 1 to n of ai times <coughs> use use the psi i here and uh, uh, this equation only needs to be enforced so only need to be enforced for vh equal to phi j j goes from 1 to n because phi j is the basis of the space xh okay so once we have this we are going to see that uh, this expansion is a little bit different from the expansion we have been using before because uh is a function of x and t here instead of just as a function of x and the fees the basis functions they stay they are just a function of x now what what would contribute to the uh being a function of t the a's are functions of t yes all right so at different time the basis stays the same same but the linear combination of these bases that gives me the solution is going to change so the a's becomes functions of t the a's evolve in time and that separation of variables are going to give us partial u partial t equal to okay this u not h can also be a function of t if you have an unsteady boundary condition to satisfy if your boundary condition change with time uh, then then you have a partial u h not partial t plus a summation of d a i d t times phi i of x so the time derivative would only apply to the a's so this is what is special about unsteady differential equations when using finite element is that the time derivative term a and b of partial u partial t times v well because i said uh, u, i mean uh and because i said vh can be replaced by phi j it becomes first of all a constant term that you can move to the right hand side so because uh the the boundary term is known so that is that is known and then plus a, a summation because the d dt can be moved out of the spatial integral right when can we do that when can we move time derivative out of space integral space yeah if the space is stationary if the bounds of the integral doesn't change with time then we can move the d a j a d a i d t out of the space integral and we are left with integration of a and b of psi i of x times phi j of x dx okay so that becomes the time derivative term we have to deal with in finite element
the rest of the terms are the same as what we are dealing with before because they only involve spatial derivatives. The rest of the terms becomes the summation of a matrix vector product and a vector. But this is different. This is a matrix. This has i and j. This is a matrix times a vector of time derivatives of the unknown solutions. Right? So, so our discretization <coughs> is no longer let's say dA dt equal to a let's say a of a so this is this happens in finite difference and finite volume but we actually have a m times dA dt equal I mean this plus b a a plus b this is what we have in finite element and this M, IJ, if you go back to the last uh, slide, MIJ is the integral of phi of, of, of psi i phi j dx. Particularly in Galerkin method, where the size are the same as phi. Okay. This is the mass matrix. And the mass matrix in Galerkin method, this is equal to just the phi i phi j dx. Symmetric matrix. So in finite element, we we need to we need to basically invert a matrix when computing the time derivative. So practically, uh, if I use if I use OD45, with OD45, I need to say dA dt equal to M inverse times AA plus B, right? And if the M is not that easy to invert, that's a, that's a costly operation. Alternatively, once we have a mass matrix, it makes sense to integrate the system using an implicit method because I have to invert a matrix anyway, right? The downside of, in, uh, of using implicit method is I have to invert a matrix every time step. But now even if you use explicit step, I need to invert a matrix. So it makes sense to use a, use a implicit. For example, um, I'm gonna use a, a trapezoidal rule, which means M times A of time step k plus 1 minus 8k over delta t is equal to a times half of 8k plus 1 plus 8k plus b. <coughs> what we do is we move all the matrix multiplied on 8k plus 1 to the left hand side. That, force, that gives me uh, that gives me m over delta t minus half of a times a k plus one is equal to uh, m over delta t right I move over there plus half of a times a k plus b now I need to invert this m over delta t minus half a but if you take a look at the matrices M I J has the same sparsity pattern as A, right? They have the same sparsity pattern because the locations, the I's and the pairs of I J where M is non sparse is, is the pairs on which phi I and phi J has non zero overlap, right? They're the same as in the matrix A where it's if you have a second order operator is where their derivatives has no overlap which is usually the same if you have first order operators is where the value and derivative doesn't overlap which is basically the same so it makes sense to use an implicit method to do the time integration all right so that's what that's 
the extent we're going to discuss unsteady methods. Any questions?